I'm here to share in the hopes my experience can serve as an example. An example of what not to do in a circumstance such as mine. I know I don't have to explain the complications faced when hosting family for the holidays. You want to make their stay as comfortable as possible. And this is what I had in mind as the Christmas season of 2017 approached. To be the kind of host I wanted to be, the bathroom of our guest room was going to need a remodeling. It had been abused to death by our older daughter during her stay in the room. It had been hers until she left for college in 2015. She would continue to stay there during visits, but when she let us know that she would be spending Christmas with her fiancé's family, my wife and I decided to invite her parents to stay with us. In the beginning, I thought I was capable of doing the work myself. I soon discovered otherwise during a visit to the plumbing supplier. A lot of the plumbing knowledge I had was outdated. Most of the products I was planning on using were hard to find or unavailable. After realizing this, I combed through the maze of business cards on the bulletin board. I copied down a few numbers and called. Everyone was busy, but one. This is the point at which I royally screwed up, but time was short. I had put off the project for too long. Rather than do the usual background check I would have, I only relied on the man's word, and he assured me that he was licensed and insured. The proof of being licensed did come, but I was given some lame excuse about not being able to find his insurance. I was past the point of caring. Christmas was just six weeks away, and a lot of work would need to be done. I was beginning to panic, but he promised me that he'd get it done with a week to spare. The renovation started off well. He had a couple of friends come in and assist with the demo. I did have a small scare when I caught one of them trying to enter my youngest bedroom. He claimed he was looking for the toilet and got lost. He apologized and I let it go. Fortunately, he never returned after that. The bad signs began after the cleanup was completed. The plumber didn't show for a few days afterwards, and when I called, he said he was getting the last of the supplies and would arrive the following morning ready to work. He did as he promised, but the work moved very slowly. I expressed my concerns more than once, and each time I was reminded of his promise. In the end, I had no choice. I was going to have to trust him. Everything I had hoped for came crashing down one afternoon. It was two weeks before Christmas, and even I could tell the bathroom wasn't going to be done in time. That morning, I decided he was going to get my help, whether he wanted it or not. We were going to work up to the last second if necessary. After lunch, I headed home. The plumber was supposed to be the only person in our home, but when I entered, I could hear a pair of voices. I followed them to the back of the house where I discovered he and another man going through our master bedroom. I confronted them. My presence clearly surprised them. And unable to come up with a lie, the pair just silently stared at each other and I was too angry to realize that I was outnumbered and in a pretty bad position. When they refused to answer, I started yelling at them to get out. When they didn't, I got even angrier and threatened to call the cops. This got them moving, but on the way out, the unknown man threatened me. Yeah, this won't be the end of it. You can be sure of that. I followed the men out and called the police anyway. As I waited for them to arrive, the danger of my situation hit me. If they wanted, they could have overpowered me, at least. I told the cops about the threat against me and they agreed to increase patrols in my area for the next week. I'm not ashamed to admit that I was scared for myself and my family. I didn't know what those men were capable of. I'm pleased to say that we haven't had any trouble with either men since. Unfortunately, the case against them never really went anywhere. The plumber had permission to be in the house after all. He also argued that he had permission to have helpers. The DA didn't think it was worth the trouble and that was where it ended. As for the bathroom renovation, it took some time to find another plumber to do the job. I was a lot more careful this go around. The guy I chose did a good job and my in-laws did stay with us that Christmas and we were all forced to share one bathroom. It was a bit of a headache but thankfully things worked out in the end. This past week, something terrible happened to a friend of mine and his wife. 
Now I'm being told that I could be held partially responsible even though I wasn't present when it occurred. I'm afraid for the future of my job and reputation, no matter the outcome. I'm a licensed plumber in the United States. I've been practicing my trade for over 10 years and never had any legal troubles. I've always been respectful of the law and I'm raising my kids to be the same. My folks raised me to believe that I'd be fine as long as I followed the rules. Up until a few days ago, this had always been true. Then, perhaps you understand my confusion when I heard I may become the focus of a lawsuit. As I said before, my friends recently had an awful thing happen to the pair of them. The story is, they had an argument with their 16-year-old son about some social media posts that he made, and as a punishment, his phone was taken away. This made the son throw a fit. He cursed them out and stormed off to his bedroom. Typical teenager stuff so far, right? And nothing else was said after that. After dinner, the couple retired to the living room to watch television. Around an hour passed and the son left his room. He visited the bathroom in the hall briefly. Then he passed his parents in the living room and entered the kitchen behind them. It was thought he was getting a meal for himself and no words were exchanged. My buddy didn't want to cause another blow up and rather than eating, the boy positioned himself behind his parents and began striking them across the heads with a blunt object. My friend received the brunt of the attack. He quickly evaded the blows tackling his son and disarmed him. The shocked couple reluctantly called the police and the boy was taken into custody. Neither parent had any major injuries other than bruising and a minor concussion. The real damage had been done to the family as a whole. He and his wife are now terrified of their son and any trust they had for him will take a very long time to repair. Unwilling to allow him to return to their home, the court was left with no other choice but to remand him to juvenile detention. His future is still up in the air. A further hearing regarding his custody will be heard early next month, and that's all I know at the time of writing this. My part in this mess relates to the weapon used in the attack. As a belated Christmas present to the couple, I offered to repair a plumbing problem in the shower of the hallway bath. They gladly accepted, and I had been undertaking the task on weekend evenings since the 1st of January. The current supply chain problems have made the job take a little longer than normal, but they seem to understand. Since the assault, work on the shower has halted. I have been focusing on my regular work and haven't had the opportunity to visit them. Out of the blue, my buddy calls me with bad news. He says that his wife was planning on suing me for leaving my tools where their son could get to them. In her mind, he wouldn't have done what he did had the wrench not been available to him. And this is ridiculous in my mind, but he believes she's serious about it. He told me he'd continue to dissuade her from going through with it, but if he was unable to change her mind, he wanted me to be forewarned. Now, you can see my issue. A civil suit is not something I can afford right now. The economy has not been good for business. I have a growing family, two young children, and one soon to arrive. We've outgrown our home and any extra money has been set aside to get a larger one. Even if I do win the suit, my insurance will go up. Not to say the hit my reputation will take. I live in a small city and things like this tend to get around quick. There's no way I could remain friends with people who sued me. And it's beginning to look like I may lose a lifelong friend and my livelihood with one act. This awful mess reminds me of another cliche my folks taught me. On this count, they weren't wrong. Life is certainly not fair. I've been a licensed plumber in the northern part of Texas for seven years. We too have our share of awful weather just like most of America. Each year I spend a lot of time and effort dealing with the damage done by it. This upcoming February marks a year since we had the worst winter weather event, certainly in my lifetime, maybe even longer. I'm sure even you Yankees in New York saw something about it on the news. In between your champagne brunches, you may have caught wind of the massive power outages we experienced. This whole frozen windmills narrative, as you might imagine, these outages caused the citizens to lose vital things like heating to their homes. Because the freeze lasted almost a week, more in some places, 
pipes froze and burst. Imagine already freezing inside your house only to have freezing water soak you and everything around you. Things were so bad, and many people actually died. Although I never want what occurred to be forgotten or be repeated, I'm not here to lay blame or suggest a fix. Rather, my purpose is to convey a few of the things I saw in the wake of that disaster. My first memory happened just as the freeze was beginning to end. I'd been bouncing around the country tackling problems great and small. I think it was Friday before I made it to this specific customer. My task was to repair the pipes already damaged and weatherproof them to the best of my ability. The pipes were located in a built-on laundry room at the back of the house. I had no reason to believe the job would be other than routine. You could tell the residents had been suffering. Everyone living there, about five, were packed together in a small room huddled near a small gas heater. The man of the house led me around back. I entered and instantly noticed a quilt wrapped around a human-shaped object resting on top of the chest freezer. My curiosity was piqued, but I held my tongue. I don't know if he noticed me looking or what, but he explained what I was seeing. And to my horror... I listened as this guy tells me how his elderly mother had passed two nights prior in her sleep. The sun porch was the only place they could store her body until the medical examiner could arrive. I was disgusted and saddened at the same time. My only option would be to do my job as fast as possible and just get out of there. I took a moment to express my condolences and then got to work. I probably didn't do a stellar job, but it would be good enough for the time being. Thinking about it still blows my mind. Nobody in 21st century America should be freezing to death in their own homes. Don't we owe the elderly a kinder passing than that? Now my second story happened a week after the thaw. Work had been crazy and I was barely getting any sleep. I got sent to this trailer park one afternoon. I didn't know where the brakes were located, I just knew it was bad. I entered the trailer and see evidence of water damage everywhere. Every bit of the resident's furniture was outside drying. He said the water was ankle deep in some places. I walk normally into the kitchen and the floor gives way all of a sudden. In less than a second, I find myself crotched deep through the floor. Just the right leg though, leaving me laying sideways in a great amount of pain. The residents ran over and helped me pull my leg out and the pain was now agonizing. Then they called 911 and I get a ride to the ER. After all was said and done, I was left with a huge bill and a broken ankle along with two repaired knee ligaments. Fortunately, I have an amazing employer who covered the bill since it happened on the clock. The six weeks off were rejuvenating but it wasn't exactly the way I'd envisioned my vacation. I've got a few more stories but I guess I'll save them for later. In the meantime, chew on this. Next time you curse your home in its cold weather and think about moving south, remember, even the great state of Texas has its share of miserable weather. Just keep us in your prayers and let's hope nothing like last year ever happens again. Back before the Rona came along in early 2019, I was apprenticing as a plumber. For a tad less than a year, I've been working at a company ran by a pair of brothers. In this story, we'll just call them Bob and Richard. Bob was the younger of the two and the one that I was apprenticing with. He'd been a plumber for over 20 years and really knew his stuff. An accomplished professional in his own right, Richard usually handled the paperwork and basic office tasks rather than going out on calls. This arrangement seemed to work well. I loved working under Bob. He was a really cool guy. That's why it was so hard to return to the job after his death. To make this story as brief as possible, I'll just provide a quick lead up to what happened. By reputation, Richard was somewhat of a ladies man. His cheating led to the termination of two marriages and countless relationships. In the morning of Bob's death, I was sick with the flu and I called in for the day. This left Bob to work on his own, something he didn't enjoy much. It also meant Richard would have to pick up the slack. The first appointment of the day was supposed to be Richard, but he refused. Bob pressed him for a reason, and Richard eventually divulged that he'd been messing around with the lady of the house. 
He added that he thought it would be weird talking to her husband. Bob was irked, but ultimately agreed to swap places. The rest of that morning is made up by witness testimony and supposition. From what came out at trial, Bob arrived just after 10 a.m. Nothing seemed wrong between he and the husband. Supposedly there was a small leak under the house. Bob squeezed down through a trap door in the hall closet. He was under the house for around 10 minutes but didn't find any leaks. By his own admission, when Bob returned to the trap door and was about halfway out, the husband approached him and unloaded both barrels of a shotgun into him. Bob died instantly, of course. The entire leak story had been a ruse. The wife testified that she heard the shots and ran into the hall. There, she was met by her husband. She said he gave her this blank look and said, he won't be screwing anybody's wife ever again. The police stated that the husband was outside smoking a cigarette when they arrived and confessed on the spot. I wouldn't hear about it until the following morning. Richard called me to tell me not to come to work. He didn't sound normal, so I asked if everything was okay. In a very matter-of-fact voice, he told me that Bob had been killed the day before. He was obviously in shock when I spoke to him. I had so many questions, but I didn't know where to start. I asked if I could speak to Bonnie, our secretary, and he agreed and handed the phone to her. I asked her calmly about what happened, and she only knew the basics. Bob had gone to a job and the customer shot and killed him. That's all we'd know for some time. The business would remain closed until after the funeral. I would become apprentice to Richard, who was now the sole plumber at the business. I could tell his heart really wasn't into his work now. I too didn't really want to be there. Everything that I enjoyed about the work died with Bob, and I still carry a bit of guilt around, wondering if I could have stopped it had I been there. Many questions would be answered with witness testimony. It would be the first time anyone outside the police had heard the discussion that went on that morning between the brothers, or about the affair for that matter. The wife explained how her husband found out about the affair. As earlier that week, during an argument, she had told him that she would make him jealous. She claimed she never thought he would turn violent. The defense claimed temporary insanity. Very few in the area bought this excuse, though. Bob had been a well-loved member of the community while the defendant had a long criminal career. After the truth of the affair came out, some jumped to the husband's side and Richard came under quite a bit of criticism, and for what it's worth, I don't believe Richard knew his brother was in trouble. The husband had assumed he'd killed the right brother until told otherwise. Bob was clearly not his target. In the end, that fact and the insanity plea did go some way in helping. The jury were unable to agree on murder and convicted on manslaughter instead. A few weeks later, the judge sentenced the husband to 25 to life. A bit extreme, but in light of his extensive record, it was very reasonable. All the while this nightmare was taking place, lockdowns began making business almost impossible. Neither Richard nor I cared too much about working, especially after he contracted it, and I feared that I'd lose another friend, as he remained in the hospital for a week. When he came out, he closed down the business permanently. I've considered apprenticing with somebody else, but without Bob... Plumbing isn't as interesting as it once was. For now, I'm not sure what the future holds for me. I'm getting by with dead-end jobs for now. No matter what I choose, striving to be my best should be my goal. That was Bob's favorite mantra. I owe it to him to carry that with me now, wherever I go. This is a story my old man shared with me one Christmas holiday over some beers. He since passed, so I can't find out anymore, and this will have to do. Dad became a plumber after his service in Vietnam. He bummed around for a few years, not really sure what to do. He even chased a dream of being in the next Led Zeppelin, and that went nowhere, sadly. After that, and hundreds of other schemes fell through, he returned home and apprenticed under his father. Some point in there, he met my mom and they got married. I was born in 1977 and he took over the business when his dad died around 2000. That's just the basics though. It's 
what happened on one specific call that I'm here to talk about. His job was to locate the source of a leak. He arrived at the location and briefly spoke to the homeowner, a retired widow, then went to work. The house was the type with a crawl space, and my dad hated crawl spaces. They're hard to move in and can be especially dirty. A lot of plumbers claimed they got fat just so they wouldn't have to mess with them. Dad was unfortunately not obese and couldn't afford to turn down the job. He returned to his truck to get his coveralls and tools. As he was getting dressed, he was sure that he could hear the leak. It had a strange hissing sound though, like it was coming out in spurts. He pulled away the door and shone his flashlight around. In the area under the bathroom was an old fruit box. A puddle of water was leaking out from under it. And satisfied that he had found the source of the leak, he crawled under the house and made his way toward the box. He reached it and began to pull it away, and a loud hissing noise came from inside. He thought the box was hung up on the pipe and water was spraying out when he pulled on it. He was going to have to replace the pipes anyway, so he yanked on the box as hard as he could. The box came away and something seemed to fall out of it. Now the hissing noise got even louder, but there was no spray of water. To get a better look, he grabbed the flashlight and pointed it in the direction of the noise. The pipe was indeed broken and leaking quite bad, but it was the massive snake that got his attention. Its long, shiny body was flexing and relaxing while a loud hissing emanated from it. Dad jerked away in fear. He couldn't see the head, but soon it curled around the body and began moving toward him. He told me that was the most fear he'd ever felt in his life. That's a big claim coming from a combat veteran. He backed out as fast as possible and replaced the door behind him. He noticed he was shaking and took a moment to gather his thoughts, unsure of what to do. Scaring an old woman to death wasn't something he relished. Instead, he called the non-emergency number and reported what he'd found. The operator transferred him to animal control and they agreed to come out. Animal control arrived and crawled in with a looped pole. A few minutes later, the officer crawled out with a snake. In the daylight, it was even larger than he'd first thought. Another officer told him it was a python. When measured, it reached about 10 feet and was about the size of his calf in the middle. The homeowner came out to see what was happening. Dad figured that she was going to keel over, but she handled it well, considering. Soon, the officers packed up the snake and took off. Now Dad was free to work on the leak, but first he scanned the crawl space thoroughly to make sure no surprises awaited him. Dad decided not to tell anyone what he'd seen, unsure anyone would actually believe him. That's the way things stayed until he told me that night. I found out in the intervening years that that type of stuff is happening more and more here in Florida. Our weather seems to be temperate enough for a lot of non-native reptiles to thrive here, and it makes sense. We do have alligators and crocodiles sometimes. According to the internet, it started as a problem of pet owners releasing them when they couldn't take care of them anymore. The problem is now reaching epidemic proportions. A lot of our native species are being wiped out. And while I personally have yet to see anything like this, I kind of hope I do. I've always wanted a nice pair of snakeskin boots. This past semester, I was required to do some research on the dangers of plumbing for my intro to the plumbing trade class. Until I did the paper, I never considered plumbing could be a dangerous job. I'm going to post a few excerpts from the report. I hope they'll be helpful. One quick thing. I want any family members or loved ones of those I write about in this story to know I'm not doing this to make light of or to laugh at their fates. I'm deeply saddened by their losses and want to prevent anyone else from suffering in the same way, and you have all my condolences. In this first example, a journeyman plumber lost his life after a terrible work site accident in 2019. Jack Lewis Martin was working at a shopping center in North Houston, Texas, when the 5 feet by 6 feet trench collapsed and buried him alive. Another worker on the site attempted to dig Martin out with a backhoe, only for the machine to also fall into the trench. It's been reported that the trench was not shored up at the time 
the company that Martin worked for, Best Plumbing, had no OSHA violations. Martin had worked for the company for 16 years. His apprentice was present at the time of the cave-in and yelled out for help. Unfortunately, it came too late to save the poor man. The victim had just recently celebrated his 41st birthday. He left behind a wife and teenage daughter, and my heart goes out to all of his loved ones. The second incident is by far the worst of them. It's a shining example of a company failing to protect their employees. In mid-November of 2015, a 27-year-old employee of Best Choice Plumbing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, was repairing an underground leak at the city's 63rd Street. The company was responsible for making sure the work zone was safe, but because they did not do their job properly, a passing motorist did not see the plumber working in the street. This caused the motorist to strike the man and kill him. OSHA did an investigation and discovered the company was responsible for 10 serious safety violations. Among these, they failed to develop and implement a traffic control program, ensure that a competent person put that program to work, instruct employees on controlling hazards on an active roadway. OSHA would go on to say, had the company put these plans into action, the plumber's life would not have been lost. The company was also fined $42,960 for its alleged negligence. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health says that between 2007 and 2012, fatalities in construction and maintenance work zones averaged 669 a year. Texas and Florida led the list. These are certainly very sobering statistics. They serve as a sad reminder to be watchful while driving through work zones. I'm sure we could all be more careful, myself included. I'm well aware many of you checked out the moment I began talking statistics, but they are a very important part of the story. We as humans often have a hard time grasping the seriousness of a matter without some form of reference. The stats serve that purpose in this case. Before I undertook this assignment, I'd had no idea of the dangers some plumbers face on a daily basis, and I hope these two stories I'd shared have done the same for you. And I will end things here. To all you hardworking men and women in the plumbing trades who risk your lives every day to keep things moving, you have my utmost respect. Stay safe, and thank you. I first want to start off by apologizing. I held off for almost a year in hopes of getting more details, but they never materialized. I didn't dare wait any longer from fear that I'd forget about the subject. During one of those endless lockdowns we had last year, I rewatched the HBO series Deadwood. A couple of scenes reminded me of a story I heard when I was much younger. After the war, several members of our family returned to Canada after working in the States. What we heard from the remaining side was only shared in letters, brief phone calls, and rare family reunions. It looks as if though I'm the last remaining link to that time. The finer points may not all be there, but I believe you all get the idea from the broader strokes as I paint them. I was told this story by an American aunt during one of those occasional cross-borders get-togethers. I was about 22 at the time and soon to be married to my first husband. I'm not sure what caused her to tell me, but I was excited to hear about anything about their side of the family. She heard it firsthand from her father who experienced it. He had been a professional plumber his entire adult life. Throughout her childhood, they often moved from place to place. I can't recall the exact town she said this occurred in. I do know that it was one of the large gold prospecting areas, perhaps Tombstone, which I know they did live in for a short time. At some time in the 1950s, he was part of a group renovating several buildings in the original section of the town. Most of these structures hadn't been touched since they were built in the waning years of the previous century. Her father's job was to install plumbing into the newly renovated buildings. Unfortunately, the work wouldn't be as straightforward as first thought. One of the first locations was in the old Chinese district. During the demolition, the crew found an intact skeleton in one of the walls. A brief investigation determined that the skeleton belonged to a woman. The doctors could never decide whether she had been put there alive or after death. 
this ghoulish discovery was just the start. In another instance, a large chest was found in the corner of the doctor's attic. Among normal things like beakers and papers, a local historian uncovered a string of human scalps. A human skull was also inside the box, but considering it was common to use real skeletons at the time, this was far less shocking. Probably the creepiest revelation and the part so similar to the Deadwood show was the mass of bones found in a rubbish pit at the back of what was once a stable. While the overwhelming majority of the bones belonged to animals like chickens and pigs, there were a handful of human ones mixed in. One theory proposed that the piece of land had once been a pigsty. It is well known pigs will eat anything, including humans. Like the television show, a person looking to dispose of a body could have fed a corpse to a group of hungry pigs. The story of Robert William Picton, the infamous pig farm killer, is the most recent example that comes to my mind. There may have been other awful things found, but they have since slipped my mind. My aunt passed away in 1997, and without her to remind me, I'm afraid the rest will be lost to history. I hope my little tale hasn't freaked you out too much. Like many, my life had been very tame and uneventful. This story was about as exciting as things get with me afraid. Either way, I hope it kept you entertained and your mind off the woes of the world, even if it was for just a few minutes. I'd never had any problems with my guys until Don Bullard came along. He'd arrived with a raft load of recommendations and obviously knew his stuff. His attitude was the only thing I foresaw being a barrier, but it wasn't bad enough for me to change my mind. His first day on the clock was early May. By June, I was already regretting my decision to hire him. I'd seen my share of idiots in my time, but that kid took the cake. Any words I spoke to him had to be met with some needlessly sarcastic remark. Had he been any other plumber, I'd have fired him. Unfortunately, he just happened to be the best at his job that I'd witnessed in a long time. This was more than likely why he was such a jerk. Even though he'd become such a thorn in my side, I would have never have guessed he was capable of what he was about to do. We did a call out to find the source of a leak, a job that any first year guy could do. So I told Don to handle it himself. I had far more pressing matters elsewhere and he was overqualified for the job in the first place. I handed him the paperwork and he took off in one of the vans. About four or five hours later I get a call from the cops. They wanted me to come in and talk to them about a problem one of my guys had just had with a customer and his wife. I was naturally curious about what had happened. It had only been a few hours and no one had called to make a complaint. Don was the only guy out on a job at the time, I knew it had to be him. It wouldn't be the first time that he had butted heads with a homeowner, but even after I pressed the officer on what had occurred, he wouldn't say over the phone. I wrapped up what I was doing as fast as possible and headed down there. When I arrived, the front desk officer led me down a long hall and into a small office with a couple of messy desks. He asked me to sit down and an officer would be with me in a minute. I twiddled my thumbs and looked around at all the diplomas and pictures on the wall. This went on for a good ten minutes before a young, skinny kid with a gun on his side came into the room and introduced himself. I told him who I was and he commenced to lay out the craziest, most shocking story I'd ever heard about someone I knew. Don had arrived at the customer's house and knocked on the door. He mumbled his purpose for being there under his breath. When the male homeowner asked him to speak up, Don repeated himself, but this time in a very loud voice. The homeowner just pointed at the crawl space and walked off. Don disappeared under the house for about half an hour. When he returned, he was wet and covered in mud. The homeowner approached him and asked if he had discovered the source of the leak. Don was said to have screwed up his face and sarcastically answered him with a, What do you think? Look at me. The remark annoyed the homeowner even more and he called Don an arrogant little a-hole. This made him fly into a rage and he began beating the homeowner about his head with a wrench. The homeowner's wife had heard her husband's screams and ran into the room to help him. 
She began punching Don in the back and he spun around and returned the favor by punching her in the face over and over until she stopped moving. He must have thought that they were both dead because he sat down on their couch and smoked a cigarette. What he didn't know was that the couple had a young son in the house and he had called the police when the fight first began. Don was on his way out the door when the officers arrived and he was taken into custody. The mother was in critical condition at the hospital but the husband had unfortunately been pronounced at the scene. Most of the information they had at that point was because of Don. The detective said that all through their investigation he had been calm and happy to answer their questions in depth almost as if he was proud of what he had done. By the time the cop finished the story, I was almost catatonic. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and at first I thought this was all a dream. I pinched myself just to make sure. Even today, when I tell people who knew him what he did, they're shocked almost as much as I was. The detective spent the next hour asking me questions about Don and if I knew why he would do such a thing. There was very little I could give him. Don had always been sarcastic, but never violent in any way. I was out of it for most of the remainder of that day. I still didn't understand what had happened until I relayed the story to my wife and listened to the words that they came out of my mouth. This all happened in August of last year. As of the time I'm writing this, Don is scheduled to begin his trial the first week of April. The charges are one count of second degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Despite being offered a more than fair plea deal, he's chosen to take it the whole way. Regardless of the result, he'll probably be spending the next 40 plus years in prison. This thought eats me up inside. Even if I couldn't stand the kid, it all just seems like such a terrible waste. This is something that happened long before I was born, but still gives me chills every time I hear it. To provide a bit of context, my grandpa Martin had just returned from fighting in the Korean War. After all the horrors he experienced, he was ready to start a family and put it all behind him. He and Granny Martin took all the money they'd been saving for grandpa's pay and bought a two-bedroom house a few blocks from elementary school. The World War I era house had its share of problems, but none were as severe as the plumbing. Roots from the many oak trees crisis crossed the road, busting and blocking up the ancient pipes. Now, Grandpa was a near master when it came to working with his hands, but he had neither the knowledge nor the time to do all the labor it would take to resolve the problem. It just happened that Granny Martin had plumbers on her side of the family, very well-respected ones in fact. Unfortunately for them, Grandpa had differences with them in the past and he was determined not to put any of his own money in their pockets. All through the spring and early summer of 55, Grandpa called plumbers one by one, but none would take on a job so large for what he had wanted to pay. He was very near to attempting it all himself when Granny confessed she had went to her family behind his back and they had agreed to do the job for his price, but only as a favor to her. She would mention to me later how she knew Grandpa would be furious at what she'd done, but the state of the pipes was driving them both crazy. He certainly was angry at hearing this, but Granny reminded him no one else was volunteering to take it on, and he had to swallow his pride and go along with it. The first week in July, Granny's uncle, his son, and their men showed up at the house to start the work. I won't bore you with the details on how the argument started, but I will say it escalated quickly. Before I get into the specifics of what occurred, I want to warn you, what you are about to hear is graphic and may upset those who have been victims or witnesses to violence in their past. You've been warned. I don't want to repeat what was said, but suffice to say it was something men usually won't let go, especially men of that time. Grandpa took exception with what the nephew said and decked him. The nephew, knowing he was outmatched, chose to back off. However, his father was furious at seeing his son get his butt kicked and attacked Grandpa with a pocket knife. Grandpa had his back turned when the attack began and took one stab to the back. He quickly turned around to defend himself but got two more stabs to the midsection before the knife blade thankfully snapped off. Unfortunately, Granny's uncle wasn't done. He picked up a nearby pipe wrench and smashed Grandpa across the jaw, then the head several times. 
If he thought Grandpa was going down, he was wrong. After all, the man had been bayoneted twice and shot once but didn't die. Him being angry just made him more dangerous. Grandpa was holding himself up on one knee and noticed a nearby length of pipe that the plumbers had been using and picked it up. Granny's uncle had stopped the attack for a moment, but when he saw Grandpa rise back to his feet, he swung again. This time, Grandpa blocked his arm and connected with his own weapon across his attacker's head. Granny described the noise as the pipe made contact like a hammer smashing a watermelon. Her uncle remained on his feet and tried to renew his attack, but Grandpa smashed him twice more across the head and he dropped to the ground, never to rise again. Everyone present was understandably upset, but the violence was over for the day. Grandpa would lose consciousness just minutes later. Even when he did regain his wits, the next day he was unable to speak to the police because of his wired jaw. The knife wounds turned out to be not that serious. The broken jaw was not the worst of his injuries, however. Doctors were forced to put a plate in his head to replace the pieces of skull lost when he was struck there. The district attorney wanted to make an example of him, so, upon release from the hospital, the cops were there to arrest him. The most serious charges were felony assault and second-degree murder. He was miraculously released on bail only because he was the family's only source of income. I imagine in a large town or city, he would have to spend the next year or more in the county jail. In some ways, it was a more civilized time. The trial did finally happen and because witnesses testified on his behalf, the jury decided Grandpa was acting in self-defense and found him not guilty. Granny Martin's support for her husband would ensure a rift would remain between her and the rest of her family until just recently. The horrible state of their homes, plumbing, which started all this mess in the first place, was resolved when they sold it to another young couple. The new buyers were all aware of the problem and had hired a company from out of town to finish the work. They must have done a good job. I believe the couple still lives there to this day. Grandpa and Granny stayed in an apartment a few years before Mom was born and they purchased a house in the same neighborhood as before. Grandpa would go on to live another 55 years without even getting as much as a cold. In the end, it was a stroke in his sleep that took him. Granny Martin is still alive and kicking at the age of 80. I was proud to know this man, but I don't have to agree with how he handled the situation to love him. Granny and I often reminisce about him and recently while doing so I had her recount the incident to me so I could write it down and share it with all you listeners. I hope the way I wrote it properly conveys the feelings of unease I feel every time I hear it. I try to portray each man without making either out to be the good guy. Even Grandpa would probably acknowledge that he could have handled things better in the beginning. If any moral could be taken away from this story, I'd think it would be that we should try to talk through our problems before we resort to violence, and if we do so, I think the world would be better for it. Don't you? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all the future narrations I make as I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember. Thanks so much, friends. And remember. Don't flush your life. Down the toilet. Oh. <laughs>